Hi, I'm Damian Lenchek. I'm Director of Cemeteries for the Diocese of Madison, and welcome to the 2024 Parish Cemetery Seminar. Each year uh, in mid to late September, I have the privilege of presenting to the sextons and business managers and uh, pastors, anybody who has responsibility for parish cemeteries and an interest in learning more and, um, uh, and, and really serving the church better in their role as, uh, as a cemeterian, uh, that's what we do at our parish cemetery seminar. So thanks for joining me. I like reading obituaries and I saw this one the other day. I thought it was pretty remarkable because uh, Richard A. Dick Ruth wrote his own uh, obituary. As you can see, he really understands the church's teaching. He knows himself well, and he knows that he's going to need some prayers. And, and I just wanted to highlight this, um, this little line from his obituary. You could look it up and read the whole thing. It's very funny. Uh, but sometimes we pretend that everybody is going straight to heaven. And, you know, and especially around the time of a funeral, there's a big temptation to canonize the person in the course of the funeral. Um, but the fact of the matter is, most of us are going to really need prayers, uh, you know, after our time comes. And, and so as cemeterians, I just wanted to encourage you all to pray for the people buried in your cemetery. Whenever you step onto cemetery property, uh, whenever I, I step onto cemetery property, I pray uh, the eternal rest prayer, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and may perpetual light shine upon them. And it, it's just a, you know, a, a simple, formal way of making sure that you are praying for uh, the dead as well as burying the dead. And we like that spiritual work of mercy of praying for the dead to go along with that corporal work of mercy of burying the dead. Now, the way I've organized this presentation uh, this year, I am responding to questions of cemeterians in the diocese who uh, asked questions uh, when they registered for the in-person session. And uh, one, one of the questions I got a lot about was cremation and what we should do about rising cremation rates. But let's let's step back a sec and think about what um, what is cremation, what does it entail, and what is the church's teaching on cremation. So here we have some cremation equipment. This is a retort or a cremation oven. The body goes in here and the flames shoot down here and uh, there's some filtering and then the air goes up uh, the stack there along with the ashes. The ashes go up the stack. What's left are bones and uh, any uh, medical implants like knees or hips or, or anything like that. Uh, anything like a pacemaker that has a battery, that's taken out ahead of time. Um, and then after cremation, they rake everything out of the retort and uh, pick through it to make sure that there's nothing but bones left. Um, and here's a couple of the uh, implements that they actually use uh, that go along with the retort to uh, rake out those bones uh, and, you know, make sure they remove all the metal before they put the bones in what they call a cremulator. It's a, it's a bone blender. Uh, because Wisconsin state law requires that cremated remains uh, be reduced to bone fragments no larger than one eighth of an inch. So while it's, it's very nice to talk about ashes, um, they're not really ashes. They are bone fragments. The ashes have gone up the chimney. Um, and uh, so what you receive at, after you uh, drop your loved one off at the crematory, what you receive in return is, uh, is bone fragments. And so the question was about what we're supposed to do about rising cremation rates. And, and here's the latest stats 
uh, from Wisconsin uh, on, on cremation. And you can see we had some slower growth in cremation, but it's been pretty steady growth over the last five years. And uh, the, the experts at Cana who keep the cremation stats are pretty sure that we're going to see uh, an increasing pace of uh, cremation uh, over the next 10 years. And so uh, we're already at, you know, above 70% cremation here in Wisconsin, and they're predicting that it goes up to nearly 85% cremation. At diocesan cemeteries, I've been tracking this for a few months, and, and, and we're right in line. There's no difference, really, that I see between this chart and the practice of Catholics. So, uh, so there is a rising cremation rate, and we have to think about what to do about that. Here, I just wanted to show you the stats for how Wisconsin compares to the rest of the world as far as cremation is concerned. Uh, you see Wisconsin circled in red there, and right next to it is the United States average. So you can see that Wisconsin is a little bit, a uh, little bit more uh, cremation is more prevalent in Wisconsin than in the United States but not nearly what it is in South Korea, where they're up at 90% cremation. Uh, but you can see in, in some countries like, uh, like Greece or Bulgaria, they really don't do cremation. You can look at a, a pretty Catholic country or, a, or at least culturally Catholic country like Italy, and you see they're at about 35%, which is less than half of what we're at in Wisconsin here. So let's think a little bit about what the church teaches about cremation, because this is very important. As Catholic cemeterians, we want to be thinking with the church. And, um, and, and so in 1963, when Pope Paul VI allowed cremation, he also said that ordinaries, meaning bishops, needed to persuade and instruct their people uh, the faithful to refrain from cremation except when forced to do so by necessity. So the, the thing is, until 1963, the church's teaching on cremation was pretty clear. Uh, but in 1963, they clarified, look, it's not a sin, but the Catholic way is to follow Jesus. And Jesus wasn't cremated. He followed the Jewish tradition of being buried. Um, and, and so that was always the practice of the church, was, was to bury the body and not to cremate. Um, this was different than the prevailing Roman culture at the time. Everybody was cremated uh, in, in Roman culture at the time. And so Christians stood out because they didn't cremate. So that was back in 1963, and the same, uh, the same language, the same sort of uh, grudging allowance of cremation, and the same preference for burial is expressed uh, by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in their 2016 document, uh, um, Resurgendum Cum Christo, which I recommend that uh, you all read if you want to go deeper into this. Just a little bit more on some of the specifics. Uh, you know, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith noticed that there were abuses that had come about with the rise of cremation among Catholics. So, uh, so they wanted to stress that cremated remains need to be laid to rest in a cemetery. Uh, they may not be uh, kept at home. You can't keep them on the mantle and be a faithful Catholic. The church says cremated remains need to come to the cemetery. The church also says it's not permitted to scatter the ashes of the faithful, air, land, or sea, or some other way, and they can't be made into jewelry. So these things already in 2016, you know, the church doesn't move very fast, but uh, it had seen that this, these were common abuses of cremated remains, and, uh, and, and they're just practices that are inconsistent with being a faithful Catholic, and, and so the church needed to speak out on that. 
All right. So we've seen that cremation rates are going up. We know the church is teaching. We know what cremation is. So now how should we handle these higher uh, cremation rates? Assuming that we're not going to, uh, you know, change all of society just by ourselves. But I think we do have a role in that. So as cemeterians, we're going to have a chance to talk to people uh, about their plans. And, and so I think we can discourage cremation and let them know that the church's teaching is that full body burial is preferred. Um, but, uh, the, you know, second rites of burial are becoming more and more common. So you've, you've got one casket in one grave and that grave is full, or you can fit some cremation burials on top of that casket. And so sometimes, um, sometimes it's a husband and wife sharing one grave, or it, it could be a mother and child sharing one grave. Uh, that, those are typical arrangements that I've seen. Uh, so we always sell a second rite of burial uh, to families that want that sort of thing. Um, we don't usually charge a full uh, a full grave price for that second right, since there's somebody already in there. So those are usually half price or something like that, some reduced rate. Um, and, and you can come up with your own policy about how many cremation burials you want to allow in each grave. I would just say you have to charge for each burial that goes in there because you're going to be responsible for perpetual record keeping for everybody in your cemetery. And the limiting factor on how many cremated remains you want to put in one grave is really memorialization. That's the limiter because a lot of headstones don't have much room for additional, um, additional names. And, and so then you're probably talking about, uh, another flat marker on the same grave. You know, maybe it's right near the headstone. Maybe it's a footstone. Uh, you want to be clear on what your cemetery allows for memorialization in those situations and that your policies uh, reflect that and are clearly communicated to people when they're like at the time of purchase. So, so that's the main uh, number one thing uh, to understand. Uh, and the number one option is, is that second, third and fourth right of burial um on on a grave that's already occupied uh so another uh idea is to offer smaller graves i mean once you've sold a grave uh you sell a full-size grave and maybe somebody was going to be buried full body and then they decide to get cremated or their family decides that for them uh so now you have one cremation burial in a full-size grave no, you can't subdivide that grave uh, because they're not using the whole thing. You can't subdivide and sell what's unused. You've sold that grave. But you can take a section of your cemetery. And what you see on the screen here is a section of Resurrection Cemetery in Madison where I took full-size graves and I divided it into six little graves. And, and so... Those are six little cremation only graves and they're, I, th I think they're 20 inches by 30 inches and each grave is allowed one uh, 12 inch by 12 inch granite marker. And so we, we sell a package um, I, and, you know, we, we lay, lay it out exactly what is allowed there. No other kind of marker is allowed. It's got to be a 12 by 12 granite. And, um, and this has been very popular. We're able to, uh, you know, sell these at a fairly reasonable rate because these are, uh, you know, one sixth the size of a regular grave. Uh, and that, um, so people like the low price, it's fairly dignified. And, um, it, and so I, I suggest, uh, you look into doing something like that. Another, um, another possibility uh, that we should look at, 
and, and that I've actually done is ossuaries. So let's take a look um, now at what is an ossuary. All right, here we are at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Janesville, and this is our Pieta Columbarium, and it has a central ossuary. An ossuary is where uh, bones are collected together. It's an ancient, um, an ancient practice. All the cemeteries in Europe uh, typically have ossuaries because they have term graves. You think about it, the, the cemeteries are often a thousand years old or more. And, and so uh, the, they've run out of space a long time ago. So people get 25 years, 30 years, maybe 50 years, and then the cemetery can resell that grave. And, and they'll dig up the bones and they put the bones in a central dignified place called an ossuary. Well, we can also use uh, an ossuary for cremated remains because those remains are bones. So you can see that there's uh, traditional uh, cremation niches uh, all around the outside, but this is a pretty large unit and there's a, a large interior empty space um, and, and that's where our ossuary is. So one of these uh, niches on the top level doesn't have a back to it. Uh, so there's no back, it's open to that space inside. And, and so for those who want to be buried uh, in this ossuary, we put the cremated remains in a velvet or silk bag and, and we lower them down uh, into that center portion of this columbarium and, and they're in the ossuary. Now the thing to remember and, and to be really clear on before putting anybody in an ossuary is that this is a one-way trip. There is no recovery of these remains. We are not going to be disturbing other people's final resting spot. Uh, so there's just no recovery of remains once they go into the ossuary. So I have a, a, a special extra form that uh, somebody who chooses this option signs to make sure they have the legal authority to put these cremated remains uh, you know, in an ossuary and that they're clear that there is no recovery. There's no disinterment. They can ask and we will say no. So we, we tell them that right up front, make sure that they sign and we keep that documentation, uh, you know, because somebody sometime is gonna be upset about that. Uh, so you, you just gotta be really clear um, going in. So there's a little bit of a risk in this and so I would say anybody in the diocese who is thinking about this for your cemetery, please talk to me and we'll go through and look at the details. All right, another question I got uh, coming into this was about green burial. Everybody wants to know about green burial. So what, what is that? It's also called natural burial. The idea is to reduce the environmental impact of the choices we make about what we want to do with our, uh, our our mortal remains, right? So, uh, so there's plenty of options for doing that that are fully Catholic. Look, we're we're stewards of creation. We we need to care for the environment. It's not our number one priority, but it's an important priority for us, and and so it's right for us to take that into consideration. So. Uh, among the things that Catholics can do that are uh, considered green uh, is uh, is to forego embalming, forego a casket, forego a vault, maybe use a natural marker, and not use power tools in the digging of a grave. So at diocesan cemeteries here in Madison, so and diocesan cemeteries are the ones in Madison, Janesville, and Beloit. And there, we have four of them. There's two in Beloit. Um, there's 125 parish cemeteries in the diocese. So I don't have direct oversight of those cemeteries. You do. 
Um, but I can, I can be a consultant for you if you run into any issues. Uh, so anyway, those, those are things that um, typically consist uh, or are typically referred to when somebody's talking about green burial. Now, there's a couple of other options uh, that are not open to Catholics that sometimes get um, called green. So there's uh, alkaline hydrolysis, which is sometimes called water cremation, which is a terrible name. Um, but that's it, it's where you put you put a body in a canister and you dissolve the flesh, uh, and then you you flush that down the drain, and you have bones left, and the bones get treated treated the same way as they're treated in cremation. They're ground up, and and so that's um, you know proponents of that say this is you're, you're getting the same thing as in cremation but uh the u.s catholic bishops have been very clear no this isn't open to catholics this this is not how we want to treat the remains of our loved ones by flushing them down the sewer uh so so that's that's not open to catholics and then composting, you might have heard of that, where they put the body in, a, you know, a pile of wood chips and, uh, you know, do kind of an accelerated composting process so that in 30 days, uh, somebody can come on, come in and, you know, pick up, uh, I think it's a cubic yard of dirt uh, that they can then use however they want. Well, the bishops have also said this is... This is not open to Catholics. That's not how we treat cremated remain or treat human remains. And and what you know when when you're going and you're picking up a bunch of dirt, you're not actually picking up remains. It's dirt. Uh, and and so uh, that's that's not an option that we're going to go with. So anyway, uh, so there are ways where if somebody's talking about green burial they can they can do it in a way that's not open to catholics uh but often it just means putting the body in the ground and that's what most burials throughout the history of the world and around the world that's that's how people have buried uh people they didn't call it green burial or natural burial it was just burial it was what you did in any case, it's legal in Wisconsin, and whether it's permitted or not really depends on the pastor. Uh, he has the final say over the parish cemetery and its policies. Uh, you know, we allow uh, the burial of a body without a casket, uh, without a vault in diocesan cemeteries. The reason you need a vault is because you get settling if you just bury a casket. A casket is at least three times the, the volume of a body. And so uh, so you have a much smaller volume if you're just burying the body. And so you'll get a little bit of settling and you'll have to do a little bit of backfilling. But cemeteries usually have lots of dirt. Uh, and, and so doing a, a little bit of backfilling as a grave settles is... That's not a big deal. Uh, however, if you had a full-size casket in there, and now you're having to backfill all of that, that's a much bigger deal. And and there's also some safety concerns because as a casket uh, decomposes, it leaves this void, and then the void slowly works its way up, and it might be 10 years, and then it's sitting there right under the grass waiting for somebody to step on it, and it's a real insurance issue. So, uh, so we always require a vault at our cemetery if somebody is going to be buried in a casket. Um, and then, you know, there, there's a question about certification by the Green Burial Council. That that seems to me like it's a marketing thing. It you don't need a credential to offer this. Um, you know, the Green Burial Council was founded in 2005, 
And for thousands of years before that, people had been doing green burial without calling it green burial and without being certified by the Green Burial Council. I just don't get the appeal of having somebody somebody else tell you, oh yeah, you're certified. That doesn't make any sense to me. But And if you think about Jesus's burial, this is why I have this image of the Shroud of Turin uh, right here. You think about Jesus's burial, he was wrapped in, in a cloth and laid in a tomb. And that, that was that. Um, there was no embalming. They were, they were coming to, you know, bring spices that, that would be wrapped with him. Um, but embalming was sort of an invention of, uh, in the United States, uh, as, as part of the Civil War, when the Northern families wanted their, uh, their sons who had died on the battlefield in the summer, uh, they wanted those bodies brought home, understandably. Uh, and how would they get home? They'd get home on the train in the summer. This is not a fast trip. And so you had to prepare those bodies for the trip. And so families would hire an embalming surgeon to go onto the battlefield and get the body and prepare the body. And, and this is how uh, uh, embalming became a common practice in the US because after the Civil War, there's all these embalming surgeons who have these skills and they want to keep offering them. And so they market their skills and, you know, and it becomes a common practice uh, in the US. So like with uh, green burial, there's other trends uh, coming down the pike. Uh, and so glass coffins, you know, will they become popular? Remains to be seen. All right. Sorry about my humor. Uh, you know, look, we have a very serious job, but serious and funny are not opposites. Uh, let's talk about a sexton's job description, because this is one of the questions I received. Um, there is a, a generic, uh, a, a generic job description on the parish cemeteries website. That's madisondiocese.org slash parish dash cemeteries. And, um, and, and you can find that there and adapt it to your parish's needs. You know, every parish is different. Every job is different. So some of these might apply and some of them might not, but generally speaking, a sexton is involved in the maintenance of the cemetery, the mowing, the plowing, the trees, the fences, and the roads, the buildings. Also, uh, sexton's probably involved in grave sales, you know, doing customer service with families that are pre-planning or have an immediate need. And so they, uh, they need to know what graves are for sale. They need to know how to receive money and what to do with it, and make sure that the cash handling processes are tight and they need to keep good records. Um, often a sexton is involved in funeral coordination. So scheduling and grave marking, the dig, often overseeing the digging. So a parish might hire a contractor to come in and dig a grave, uh, but the sexton needs to make sure that that grave is dug in the right place. Uh, there might be some responsibility for preparing the graveside for committal, uh, making sure the grave is closed after the committal, and then uh, you know making it beautiful again, growing grass there. Records maintenance, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, sections have a role in record maintenance. Uh, you have to monitor inventory. So if like you need to be telling the pastor if your cemetery is almost full. Uh, so so you can kind of keep an eye on that. Maybe once a year, do a calculation and say, how many more years left do we have? Likewise, you keep an eye on capital needs. So you alert the pastor, uh, like if the roads are nearing end of life or the fences, if there's gonna be a big expense coming up, you wanna give the pastor as much notice as possible. And, and you wanna help the cemetery committee or the business manager be setting aside money uh, to um, to address those needs. You don't want to be in a position where you have 
fifty thousand dollars worth of road work and you haven't been planning for it and you haven't been saving for it um sexton's also might have some role in the perpetual care fund so uh you know this is usually going to be more the business manager and the pastor but those perpetual care funds need to be invested uh you know responsibly and uh, uh you know the port a, a portion of every grave sale needs to be going into perpetual care and so while that might not be a direct sexton responsibility the sexton can make sure that that's happening because when you run out of space you're going to need that care fund to fund the upkeep of the cemetery so that's what it's for it's sort of the retirement account for the cemetery and then um you know a sexton should be called on to support the cemetery committee often the sexton is going to be a member of the committee ex officio but even if he isn't he should come to cemetery committee meetings because your day-to-day -day, you know a sexton is day-to-day -day, uh at the cemetery and often cemetery committee members might not be so like i said you need to adapt it for your own parish's needs and, and so um you know take a look at that and uh whatever you like keep it and whatever you don't there's no obligation all right i got this interesting question about whether there should be a separate section for unbaptized infants so before 1983 the answer would have been yes uh because there were detailed laws and canon law uh specifying who could be buried in a catholic cemetery since 1983 we don't have uh, we don't have that. Uh, all those all those laws went away, and really the rule is it's a corporal work of mercy, and it's a good thing to do. It's always a good thing to do is to bury the dead, and so you don't need a separate section for unbaptized infants um, at uh, diocesan cemeteries. We offer free burial for infants one year old and less. Um, you know, often these are young families and they don't have a lot of money. And so this is a little thing that we can do for them. Um, and we don't, you know, often if there's a stillbirth, the, the child hasn't been baptized, but that doesn't make any difference to us. We'll, we'll bury that child. We do, you know, we are for Catholics. We're Catholic cemeteries and our prime, our primary service, um, audience as Catholics and and so uh, usually if a non-Catholic wants to be buried in our cemetery my first question is do you know somebody is, you know are were you married to a Catholic and that's usually the case if they're if they're trying to come in but you know if if they have no connection to the cemetery other than it's pretty and I'd like to be buried here uh, and they're not Catholic I, I ask them if they'd like to become Catholic. Um, you know, people can become Catholic for all sorts of reasons. If we really believe that what we have is true and good and beautiful, we shouldn't be shy about offering it to people who really want it. Um, and, and then, you know, if, if they don't want to become Catholic, I usually say, look, if nobody else will bury you, we will bury you but you need to go and check with some other places first. So I got the question, what is the best equipment for trimming? And, you know, this is what we use at our cemeteries. It's a, it's a gas powered uh, steel uh, weed whacker. I don't know of any shortcuts really. Um, and I, I don't have any tips on technique, but there it is. Uh, the best equipment for trimming. All right. Do we really have to keep records? And the answer is yes. The state of Wisconsin requires that cemeteries maintain records. Actually, what the law says is that the cemetery board shall promulgate rules requiring cemetery authorities um, to maintain records. So, uh, so the answer is yes, you have to keep records. So then the question is, what records do we have to keep? Well, the uh, the state is very obliging. It tells you you have to keep the name of the the deceased, last known address, 
date of birth, date of death, date of burial, exact location in the cemetery where the burial is, uh, the name of the person authorizing the burial, along with their relationship to the deceased, the name of the funeral establishment, the type of burial vault, and uh, the type and style of grave marker. So you're responsible for keeping all those records. They can be on paper, they can be on computer, but you, you need to keep them in perpetuity. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, take a look and see what information you're collecting and, and see if you have to uh, come up with a, a, a different way of doing things. So I got a general question about what forms uh, does our cemetery use? We use so many forms. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of our most common ones. This is the burial scheduling form that we use at diocesan cemeteries. Um, now, you got to understand, we sell monuments, we sell vaults, we sell uh, uh, caskets. So these are and we and we don't do funerals uh so we do committals at the cemetery almost never funerals funerals usually happen at the parish so so this might not be that helpful for you but when we get a call we start filling this out and we collect all sorts of information about the responsible party and who the funeral director is and, and so what i would say is don't don't copy this form so much as use it to make your own form where, you know, think through what information do I need to collect from, uh, from a funeral director when he calls, um, and get all that written down because, and you want to be able to put that right in the files, uh, and, so that you're doing that records retention bit. All right, this is a generic parish cemetery easement. Uh, it's available online at the parish cemetery's website, and the address is right there. Um, so, I mean, this is just very old standard language. Um, and it basically says on this date, um, we got this amount of money and, uh, and this person gets this grave. And, uh, and so that person is the grave owner. Here, the grant is, is called the grantee. So the grantee is the grave owner. We don't specify who can be buried in that grave. The grave owner always specifies who can be buried in the grave. And we don't ask the grave owner to specify that at the time of purchase because a lot of things can happen between when a person buys a grave and when that grave gets used. So um, there, there can be, uh, you know, deaths in the family. People can move. There can be divorces and remarriage, and, and and so you know, if ten years goes by between when the grave was purchased and then, uh, you know, when it's going to be used life might be very different for the grave owner or maybe the grave owner himself has died and and so somebody else is the grave owner because grave ownership ends at death and so then the ownership passes to the spouse and if there's no spouse then it passes to the children and if there's no children then to the grandchildren and so um so anyway all that's to say uh our form doesn't specify who gets to be buried in that grave it just says that this is the person who owns the burial right in that grave they don't own the grave they can't build a tiny house on it or anything like that it's not real estate they have permission to bury one person in that grave and if they want a second right that's a separate contract all right here's another form that we use it's the application to erect a memorial and there's a part where there's an agreement between the cemetery and uh, and the grave owner, uh, you know, just specifying rights and responsibilities and laying out everything 
about the relationship there. And then there is a section of this about the relationship between the cemetery and the monument company. Uh, so you, you should really be using this form, making sure that no, uh, no memorials get placed in your cemetery without this form on file. And one of the things this ensures is that the pastor gets to review every design of a memorial that's going to be placed on sacred ground. We don't want anything anti-Catholic being placed on sacred ground. So you can find this, um, this form at the website. And there's also a sample policy uh, for uh, you know, what's allowed, what sorts of designs are allowed and what are not allowed uh, at the cemetery. All right, there was a general question on pricing. I'm just going to make a couple of remarks here. I don't know if I'm going to cover everything, but uh, parishes should be raising grave prices annually. Just get on a regular schedule. Inflation is going up every year, and your grave prices should keep pace. Otherwise, you're not doing justice to the people who are already buried there. Um, you know, with Into the Deep, there's a lot of... Um, the, the parishes are becoming much bigger and often they have multiple cemeteries. Grave prices at different cemeteries don't have to be the same because it's a, it is a little bit like real estate, location, location, location. So if you're in a more urban setting, uh, your prices are probably gonna be higher. If you're in a more rural setting, they're probably gonna be lower and that's okay. Uh, you don't have to have exactly the same price. You know, some places can support $300 a grave. You know, in Madison, some of my graves go for $3,000 and up. So, uh, so there doesn't, you, you really have to look at the market and make a considered decision. Um, you know, but it gives you a chance to take a look at what's being uh, charged at different cemeteries and you know, maybe a cemetery hasn't raised grave prices in 10 years. That happens quite a bit. Well, they've got some catching up to do. Um, I'd also say to have an in-parish rate and a non-parish rate. So, you know, if somebody's been coming to Mass and they've been tithing, it, it makes sense that they would get the in-parish rate, which would be lower. And maybe if their parents come, and maybe maybe the parents are from out of state, but they want to be buried in their children's cemetery um, at their at their parish. Well, you know they're from outside the parish, and you know they can they can expect to pay a little bit more than uh, than the parishioners. So so I think it's a good I good idea, a good practice to have an in parish and an out of parish rate. I w I certainly wouldn't exclude people from outside the parish from being buried in the parish cemetery especially if you have a non, you know, out of parish rate, because, you know, that is really going to support the long-term growth of the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund. And, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, be sure that you are charging for second rights of burial. The person doesn't own the grave, right? It's not like they can just bury as many people as they want there. No, every burial, you have to charge for it. Um, make sure that, uh, you're, uh, you're collecting perpetual care for each grave that you sell and, and be sure that's going into an investment account. So, and, and one thing I would say about, um, you know, pastorates and these new parishes that are being formed that are going to have multiple cemeteries, you got to have the same pricing structure. And so... You can't have one cemetery where, um, where, where the grave price includes perpetual care and then another cemetery where uh, the grave price is one line and perpetual care is broken out. Let, let's have the same system for pricing. Even if the grave prices are different, um, you, you charge for a grave, you charge for a second right, you charge for... Um, perpetual care and these, and these are sort of separate line items and that that just makes it easier for the accounting 
uh, you know, for the pastor to be able to look at one thing and, and see what's going on there. Um, you know, it, there's other things like, uh, you know, grave marking is, is marking the grave for the grave digger included in the price of the grave or not. And, and so different cemeteries do it differently. And that's something that can change without really harming uh, the integrity of the cemetery and it makes the operations easier to manage. And so look for ways to make the pricing structure consistent from cemetery to cemetery within a pastorate. All right, there's, I always get asked, what cemetery software should I use? There are so many uh, software packages out there. Um, the diocese doesn't mandate that you use any cemetery software um, at all or any in particular. I'll just share a few that I'm most uh, familiar with. Um, Mosersoft has a cemetery software package that's very budget friendly. It's a little stripped down, uh, but if you're not, if you don't have any uh, cemetery software and you don't have a lot of money to spend, this might be uh, a good option for your parish and your cemetery. Raymaker is a local engineering company. They are they they have a product called Sims C I M S. A cemetery Information Management System. They presented at our seminar last year and a really great company. They got a great product. It's maybe a little bit expensive, but I know that there are some parish cemeteries that have adopted it and are very happy with it. It's easy to use, powerful, um, can't go wrong. There's a uh, a cemetery package called Burroughs that uh, maybe a dozen parishes uh, in our diocese use. My understanding is that Mr. and Mrs. Burroughs are quite elderly and they don't have a succession plan. And so, uh, so there, the question is, how do you make that transition from Burroughs to another software package? And both Mosersoft and Raymaker are going to be able to help with that. And, and pretty much any, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, any, any reputable uh, cemetery software company is going to be able to help. Uh, at the diocese, we use HMIS, which is a very powerful program. It's very well established. It's also very old and it feels old. It feels like it was built on DOS. It's not easy to use. I mean, it was built on DOS and it still feels like it. Um, so I don't recommend that. Um, it, it's probably not the right software for a parish cemetery. And then um, I have, uh, uh, for parts of my cemeteries, I have Bihar uh, mapping and I really like them. Uh, and so we can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, I just thought I'd share one, um, one issue that came up uh, at one of my cemeteries with mapping, because there were some questions about mapping uh, that we received. This is a picture of the lawn crypt section of Resurrection Cemetery. If you don't know what a lawn crypt is, it's where they take a bulldozer and they scrape an area flat, and then they put in uh, double-decker vaults right side by side with like a half-inch gap between them. It, it's much closer than you can get a vault in when you're doing it one at a time. You know, if, you, if you're digging one grave at a time, you need three, four inches on, on a side uh, because you're not always going to get the vault in exactly straight and stuff like that. So in a lawn crypt, they pre-bury the vaults all at once. They're, they're real close together. And so the grave sizes are smaller, which is more efficient, more graves per acre means your cemetery lasts longer. So it's a great idea in theory. It's a little capital intensive. And so uh, you, you can see in the little Excel map, and that's, uh, that's how we keep our, uh, our sales maps at uh, Resurrection Cemetery. You can see the original plan was for a rectangular uh, lawn crypt area. 
uh, but it turned out that was pretty expensive. And so they came up with a nice, <coughs> excuse me, a nice um, sort of cross shape uh, lawn crypt area. And, and you can see the darker borders of some of these uh, Excel cells. Um, and, and so those were, that was where they buried uh, the vaults ahead of time and the rest of the graves are normal graves. Well, our normal graves are bigger than um, uh, lawn crypt graves. And that's, that's just how it is. But the map didn't reflect that. So this was done back in the 1980s. And, you know, sometime a few years ago, we realized that we were running out of room and we were trying to figure out like there was supposed to be a grave there and there's not a grave where we thought one was supposed to be. And, and finally figured out that it's because this section has two different sized graves. And now, now I have people already buried in there and I need a plan for how to remap this section of the cemetery without having to move people's graves. Um, so, uh, I had Wiser Engineering out, a uh, great company. I enjoy working with them. Uh, so first they did a survey. Then, uh, you know, I talked with an engineer about how we could, uh, do a grid system such that I wouldn't have to move any of the people who are already buried and I'd be able to uh, uh, keep my promises to the people who already purchased graves. And, and so that was a tricky engineering uh, thing. And we ended up dividing what had been one section into six different sections. So that area we used to call section 11 and now it's called lawn crypt. It's marked as LC there and section 11 and 11 a B C D E F and uh, and then once we had the sections uh, you know decided on then wiser engineering came out and they staked the area and you can see the triangular stakes are the old stakes and the um, the circular uh, stakes are the new ones and that's how you know where to dig a grave especially in the winter you need those stakes and then you measure from there uh, from one stake to the other you find three stakes and then you can be pretty sure you're uh, digging in the right place so after we did the survey and the engineering and the staking um, I had this computerized data and I was talking to Bihar mapping and they gave me a great deal on uh, mapping my troublesome section. And so here you can see a map that uh, Bihar makes for us. And the nice thing is it plugs into HMIS, which is our database. And so when we sell a grave, it'll turn from white to, uh, to gray. And then when, when the grave is occupied, it'll turn from gray to blue. And then we had them color code the irregular sized graves that we were left with as pink. And so those, um, those can be used as cremation graves, but they will not accommodate a full body. So we've talked about my problems with mapping. Uh, there was a question about how do you plot a new section of your cemetery? If it's immediately adjacent to something that's already plotted out, it's not that difficult. Um, so the main thing you have to be absolutely crystal clear on is your grave size. Uh, so just keep using whatever you've been using if it's working. Um, I would ask around and see if anybody in your parish has some experience with, uh, with surveying because, uh, you know, they could come out and you can make a day of it and lay out a new section. You're going to want some stakes. I, I, uh, I'm showing a, a sample 
a state grid there where you get you know one two three four five graves by two graves and there's stakes in the corners of those ten graves and that's really going to help you uh, you know stay on track when you're doing burials in that section because you're going to measure off those stakes to locate the grave um, so if it's a brand new section and you don't know anybody with surveying experience, you can hire a surveyor. It's not that expensive, um, there is, but it is an expense. Uh, and then, uh, and your surveyor will probably be able to stake it for you. Um, I have a picture there of a typical stake. You know, you find them in the winter with a metal detector. Um, and, uh, and there you go. So that's plotting a new section. So if there's no sexton, will the diocese manage your cemetery? Uh, not going to happen. Sorry. Um, the diocese doesn't really want to be in the business of managing cemeteries. Um, the way we ended up with four cemeteries, these were multi-parish cemeteries. Um, and at some point in the 1970s, I think, Wisconsin state law changed and it made it awkward for multiple parishes with different tax ID numbers to be responsible for one cemetery. So rather than sticking a big cemetery as the responsibility of one parish, the diocese said, no, we'll, we'll step in, we'll manage those cemeteries. But we're not looking to manage any more cemeteries. If there's no sexton, the pastor needs to uh, needs to appoint a sexton, and get some people to help him manage the cemetery. Uh, so that's that's um, how th how that works. So we're going through into the deep, which is a, a restructuring process where we're going to go from 102 parishes in our diocese down to 30. And the question is coming up, will assets of individual cemeteries be kept separate in the mergers? And the answer is no. It's a merger and uh, you don't need multiple uh, accounts uh, to manage multiple cemeteries. So I manage four cemeteries. I care deeply about each one of them. I make sure they all have what they need. I have one cemetery operating account and one investment account for the perpetual care funds. And more than that is just not needed. And, and I know that it's a big change in thinking, like this money belongs to this cemetery. The, the fact is the new parish is going to be responsible for all the, par all the parish cemeteries in that parish. And it, it doesn't matter where where the money is uh the parish has to take care of it um so uh donor intent will be respected so if somebody gave uh you know a gift to resurface the roads in such and such cemetery uh you know because that needed to be done of course that gift uh and that donor intent is going to be respected um but there's a lot of individual cases. So uh, parish financial services here at the diocese is working with each parish, getting them ready for the mergers. And, and that's part of the process. Everything will be reviewed by the legal team to make sure that we're doing it right. And, um, uh, but, it, but the main thing is that we're going to care for all of our cemeteries and, um, and, and so that's the main thing to keep in mind. So that's really all I have, uh, for you for this year for the parish cemetery seminar. Thanks for joining me again. If you have any questions, be sure to give me a shout. I am here to help, uh, as much as I can. And, uh, my number is 608-821-3055. Uh, Damien at madisondiocese.org is my email address. That's D-A-M-I-A-N at madisondiocese.org. Love to hear from you. And 
Thank you for all your work in parish cemeteries. Bye-bye.